So thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Roderick Crooks. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, Irvine. And um, I was invited to your school by Dean Richards to talk about critical reading. Um, so I'll give you just like a brief, I'll give you my resume, how's that, um, to explain to you how I got here. And then um, I'll tell you a little bit about the format of the talk, which I hope will be a conversation. Um, meaning that if there is something that you want to talk more about, you could raise your hand and say, let's talk more about that. Or um, if there's something that you are disinterested in, you could roll your eyes and I'll move to go <laughs> faster. Um, but definitely, we want to maybe have a little bit of back and forth. So um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Irvine. I'm in the department of informatics. Informatics is the study of use and users of technology. Uh, my specialty is the use of education technology in urban schooling. Uh, my doctoral work, that's okay. Um, I'll pause, there you go. <laughs> Musical accompaniment is fine. Uh, so um, I actually study those devices, but in the context of public education. So I think many of you may have heard about um, the use of iPads in Los Angeles uh, public schools some years ago that became controversial. Um, so that's what my dissertation work was about. I went to a school for three years and watched what they did with iPads. Um, so it's not a direct link to reading, but I am very interested in issues of media uh, and interpretation. So my current project is also about education technology applied to public education, but here in a slightly different context. So um, I think about all the devices that we use for schooling. So that could be tablets, it could be uh, laptops, it could be phones, um, it's also platforms, so different kinds of software and websites. And I think about the data that are generated by all those devices, particularly in the context of public education, compulsory K through 12 education. So um, after studying for a while hardware and software, I became curious, well, all these devices are generating data all the time, right? Where does this data go? And so that formed the basis for my current project. So right now I'm studying data science, or techniques of data aggregation and analysis applied to these data. So um, I start at the school, and so I look at the different kinds of data that are generated, and then I follow them to data centers and analysis centers where white collar professionals analyze these data and then feed back to schools directions about how they should do education. So um, that's what my current project is about now. And again, um, Maybe that's a different kind of reading, a statistical and numerical reading, but still, I think, uh, relevant. Um, I came to informatics research uh, from art school, so uh, I also have a fiction writing practice. Uh, my first degree is a Master of Fiction Writing from the University of Iowa. Uh, I'm also a librarian, um, so like, there we go. <laughs> In fact, that's how I was invited here, through the uh, cabal of librarians that secretly run the world. <laughs> um, so, um, and so through library work, I became interested in information technology and learning, and so that's how I ended up at the Department of Informatics. So one thing about um, doing research at informatics is that there is very little teaching, so I don't often get to interact with students. So um, I definitely wanted to thank Lisa and um, Andrea for inviting me here, so um, I could spend time with students. I did teach English for some years, and um, I miss working with students. It's lonely, sort of being the fly on the wall, doing research. So um, I'm going to talk to you about critical reading, and here's what I hope we can accomplish uh, in the time together. The first thing I want to do is um, a kind of quick activity uh, that I stole from your very own Rob Fox. Um, so we'll maybe do an activity to get started. Um, and in that activity, we're going to talk about, we're going to figure out what we mean by reading. Then I hope to spend the whole rest of the talk kind of problematizing this idea of reading. If we could exert a little bit of pressure on the concept of reading and see if that would generate some way to think more productively about our own practices of reading. So rather than sell you on a set kind of kit of techniques that I think you should do when you read, I'm instead going to turn around and say, what kind of reading can critical reading be? And as I hope to show you over the course of the talk, all answers to this question have to be provisional because they are largely situated within your own subjective reading, or at least partially within your subjective experience. And then as a kind of thematic beginning, um, I wanted to show you this picture. This is a 3D rendering made using Google SketchUp of the famous 
fictional library that is in uh, Borges's uh, Tower of Babel. Um, does anybody know this work? This is a work from Borges. It's collected in a, in a collection called Ficciones. So the premise of the story is that uh, a narrator uh, who is never named and never identified describes the world in which he lives. And it's a world of hexagonal chambers, an infinite number of hexagonal chambers, which are connected to one another. And inside each hexagonal chamber are any number of books arranged at random. And so the narrator of this book goes on to describe this infinite library, which is full of every possible book that has ever been invented. Each book also contains every possible combination of words and letters that could also exist. And all the books are, they're just left on the shelf. There's no, there's no organization between the books. It's just an endless, infinite expanse of every possible kind of books. So he describes this as, not a kind of joyous or happy place, but as a kind of limbo, um, a way in which all the different uh, worlds contained within books constitute a world that is discontinuous, that's discombobulated, that's disoriented, where whatever knowledge is held by one book cannot communicate with knowledge that is held by another book. I'm going to just kind of leave that hanging for a minute, but when we come back to the end, um, I hope that we can pick up this idea of the connections between books or between sources of information, and maybe talk about that some. Uh, I don't know how to advance this. Let's do this activity. So you'll need a writing utensil and you'll need something to write on. We'll do this, we'll do this maybe um, four minutes. How's that? So here's the prompt. Uh, I define critical reading as, and I'll just give you a minute to just get right into it. I'm actually going to start the timer now. So give me, give me maybe four minutes. I define critical reading as. some bold person like to share what they wrote? I'd love to hear from a student. Is there a student in the room who would say what they wrote? Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. Hi. What's your name? Rose. Rose, okay, thanks. Um, I define critical reading as reading while questioning, talking between content and context, uh, reading closely and paying attention to moments that are particularly jarring or particularly resonant, and trying to connect those feelings to the other ideas. Okay, excellent, thank you. I think I heard Questioning. Mm -hmm. I heard. Um, did you say tacking? Like tacking back and yeah, forth. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. a good one too. So questioning, tacking mm -hmm. back and forth. And I think at the first. What was the first thing you said? Um, I should have brought something to no, write. That's right. uh, reading about questioning. Tacking questioning. That was the one I was thinking of. Okay, so asking yourself questions. Does this sound familiar to people? Okay, I think actually this is hyper familiar and perhaps even overly familiar. I think maybe we are already aware of what constitutes critical reading. And so a talk today that rehearsed these practices might actually just repeat what you already know. Um, were you going to read something also? Uh, yes. Can I hear it? My mind. Um, That's very for impressive. Me, <laughs> for me, critical reading is a process that provides the opportunity to create understanding and also through analysis, observation, and create connection. Okay, very sophisticated. I'm actually very impressed too, since you had to hold all that in your head. I can't hold that much at one time, but I got process and analysis. Does that also sound familiar to people? So I know for sure that um, a list circulated prepared by Dean Richards, which prepared for you an excellent list, which had a lot of uh, sort of tools that you could use. I'm going to call them practices, but maybe best practices would be a way to think about this. A list of things to do that makes a reading critical. Is that fair? So what I'm saying is, our talk about critical reading 
can be more productive than just a list of best practices, particularly since I think the audience already knows what those best practices are. Actually, that's not a guess. I know you know. I saw the list. We've all seen, we've all seen that list. And that list is familiar to us. In a certain way, we already know what we're supposed to do to make reading critical. Um, so what I'm going to suggest maybe is that reading could be more critical than a list of best practices. Um, but again, what that looks like will be provisional and contingent. So um, as a thought exercise, I actually want to do a sort of twin to this writing activity. Um, if I can figure out how to advance it. And we'll just go four minutes again, like we did before. So if critical reading involves analysis, and it involves questioning, and it involves a process, and it involves getting, I think you said getting closer to the context of what you're reading. What then is uncritical reading? So let's spend again four minutes, do the same thing. I define uncritical, or maybe you want to say non-critical reading. What is non-critical reading? Maybe? And we'll just do four minutes again. Okay, so how about this business of uncritical reading? Can anybody maybe read me what they wrote about uncritical reading? I have some. Oh, hi, thank you. Yeah, What's I'm your name? A, I'm a new student. Um, What's your name? <coughs> my name is Najla Nori. Okay, thanks for reading. Yeah. yeah. Um, non critical reading is expressing the inner self that you would normally not share with someone else that may judge you. Okay, that's non critical reading. I like this idea of judgment. We're going to come yeah. back to that. Yeah. But non critical reading is maybe the kind of reading that we privately do. Uh, maybe that we don't want other people to know about, right? But that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. non. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on this, and yeah. we're going to actually come back to the issue of shame in reading. What else is non-critical reading? Yes, please. Uh, wrote, What's uh, your name? Uh, Phyllis. Hi. Okay. Thanks. Um, I wrote non-critical reading is for entertainment. Okay, entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I guess then, do we assume the opposite that critical reading then is not for entertainment? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yeah. right? If it's critical, if it's critical, it must be boring, right? No. Is, that, is that what we're saying? I think that's. I think that's probably the. Con I, I would actually say that's probably what we think as a group. Again, if we weren't ashamed to say it, I think we probably would admit that critical reading is boring. Is well, that fair? It's boring. Yeah, it's a boring. Okay, I think it's an open question. Who else was going to read something? Yes, ma'am, please. Yeah. Uh, Can you say your name for us? Um, my name's Alice. Okay, thank you. Alex. I'm a student here. Okay, uh, psychology. Okay. Um, I think it's material read that can emotionally sway opinions. Emotions, opinions. Yeah. This is uncritical. I think so too. I think we would put it in that camp. Can we hear? Yeah. Um. Say I, your name first. Alyssa. Alyssa. Yeah, and I, I wrote many of the things other people have said, but also uncritical reading is just believing in the veracity of the author. Okay. Just saying, okay, what they have to say is. Sure, sure. Um, there's some sense in which maybe we're like, uh, trusting. trusting, that's a better way to say it. Yeah, great, trusting. Okay, does, did anybody else want to contribute to this? Okay, yes, sir. Uh, I, Leo. From okay, the Leo, thanks. Uh, I just put, I went the easy route and just chose the opposite of what we had before, so I put reading this purely, well, purely for pleasure, or reading that is read without questioning, or any system to process any information or data after or during the reading. So this is actually what I was getting at, right? Which is, the first thing I'm going to point out is that all of these, this division of reading into critical and uncritical is hyper-familiar to all of us. So um, I'm not suggesting that it's because we all read the same sheet. I just think these are kind of ambient definitions of reading that we're all working with just from our own educations and just from life at this moment. But we have a kind of critical reading, which is about questioning, which is about holding a highlighter, which is about asking yourself questions. And we have an uncritical reading, which is pleasurable and which is um, maybe a more trusting process. Uh, the thing I want to point out, though, is that we're super familiar with these definitions. But note that in both, reading is presumed to be the same activity. So whether it is critical or whether it is uncritical, reading itself is unchanged in this, in this binary. So in theory, you could read one material, let's say, um, one of these pleasurable readings, a magazine, right? You could read it critically, or you could read it uncritically. 
So what I'm interested in actually here is not just adding the prefix critical to reading. I'm interested more in getting into this reading that can be critical or can be uncritical, and maybe putting pressure on this concept of reading. Again, a, a kind of conception of reading that is so familiar to us, it's actually hard to see it. And I think that this reading looks something like this. Oh, I just advanced somehow and didn't know how to do it. That's fine. Okay. So, um, in both critical and uncritical modes, reading looks something like this. So this is a highly schematic, not very detailed view of what we think reading is. And so on the left we have a text, here it's a book, and it is presumed to be a solitary unit which contains some kind of encoded information. So information that has been typed in, say, the English language, stored on the pages, and the book is a, is a material artifact, it's something solid, it contains a finite, fixed amount of information. So reading is when you take this unit, which is bounded and lives by itself, and you scan it for its informational content. In this view of reading, this kind of hyper-familiar view of reading, a human is just an apparatus for scanning text. In this diagrammatic view, it doesn't matter who's doing the reading. All reading is the same. If it's on the beach reading a magazine and it's uncritical, if it's in your uh, library here in preparation for class and it's critical, we still presume that this is what the activity of reading entails. Finally, what is the result of reading? Reading is when you scan information from a text and now you hold that same information unmediated, unchanged, inside your mind. So this is, this is my view of what I would say a, can, a canonical view of reading. An author that I'm going to read to you from a little bit later calls this the tripartite, excuse me, tripartite con, uh, conception of reading from modernism. It's not that important uh, what we call it. I'm just going to say this is to me the standard kind of regular model of reading. And so what I want to do today is maybe show some ways in which we know already that this is not the situation of reading. So to me, critical reading wouldn't just be the suffix attached to the reading that we already do. It would be some way of challenging or thinking about this activity, or finding some way to redefine this activity. So I'm going to just go through the three parts here in order. And I'm going to just read to you from texts that other people have written about these kind of various places in the process of reading. And then at the end, we'll see if it adds up to anything. So first, I'll start with um, this excerpt. So this is a book called How to Talk About Books You Haven't Read. It's written by a literary critic. Um, and so in this book, the literary critic Pierre Bayard just describes uh, real-life situations in which people are called upon to talk about books that they haven't read. For example, he uses the example of an aging scholar who goes into his immense library and opens a book uh, which he thumbs through and realizes rubbish, cover to cover. He thinks, what idiot wrote this book? And then realizes that he is the idiot who has written this book some decades earlier, but has forgotten the book that he himself wrote. Um, so that's just one of the situations. There's like maybe 10 of these. They're very short kind of um, comical episodes where people have to talk either to them, either in a public forum or in writing about books that they haven't read. This is where we uh, connect to that idea of shame that came up a little bit earlier. And so what the author is talking about, he introduces this idea of non-reading. And so he says just that there's a bunch of different ways of reading, there's also a lot of different ways of non-reading. And so what he's getting at is just this kind of canonical view of reading. This uh, is actually just a kind of narrow subset of the phenomenon that is reading. And so what he's trying to do is rescue some of these other forms of reading, which he calls unreading. I'm not going to pursue that term, but it's the same idea that we're working with here, which is that reading is a big phenomenon. And if we could be honest or take seriously all the variety of this phenomenon, it could be productive for us as scholars. And that's just all that he does in this book. Um, so he's saying that this version of reading, where you pick up the book and you work through the pages one at a time until you reach the back of the book, decoding the text line by line, the, the main point he wants to make is that that's a relatively isolated and rare form of reading, that a lot of the times we're doing different kinds of reading. Um, so I'm just going to read to you a little bit from this text. He writes, 
Born into a milieu where reading was rare, deriving little pleasure from the activity, and lacking in any case the time to devote myself to it, I have often found myself in the delicate situation of having to express my thoughts on books I haven't read. Because I teach literature at the university level, there is, in fact, no way to avoid commenting on books that most of the time I haven't even opened. It's true that this is also the case for the majority of my students, but if even one of them has read the text I'm discussing, there is risk that at any moment my class will be disrupted and I will find myself humiliated. In addition, I am regularly called on to discuss publications in my books and articles, since these, for the most part, concern the books and articles of others. This exercise is even more problematic, since, unlike spoken statements, which can include imprecision without consequence, written commentaries leave traces that can be verified. As a result of such all-too-familiar situations, I believe I am well-positioned, if not to offer any real lesson on the subject, at least to convey a deeper understanding of the non-reader's experience and to undertake a meditation on this forbidden subject. It is unsurprising that so few texts extol the virtues of non-reading. Indeed, to describe your experience in this area, as I will attempt here, demands a certain courage, for doing so clashes inevitably with a whole series of internalized constraints. Three of these at least are crucial. The first of these constraints might be called the obligation to read. We still live in a society, on the decline though it may be, where reading remains the object of a kind of worship. This worship applies particularly to a number of canonical texts. The list varies according to the circles you move in, just practically forbidden not to have read if you want to be taken seriously. The second constraint, similar to the first but nonetheless distinct, might be called the obligation to read thoroughly. If it's frowned upon not to read, it's almost as bad to read quickly or to skim, and especially to say so. For example, it's virtually almost unthinkable for literary intellectuals to acknowledge that they have flipped through Proust's work without having read it in its entirety, though this is certainly the case for most of them. The third constraint concerns the way we discuss books. There is a tacit understanding in our culture that one must read a book in order to talk about it with any precision. In my experience, however, it's totally possible to carry on an engaging conversation about a book you haven't read, including, and perhaps especially, with someone else who hasn't read it either. Moreover, as I will argue, it is sometimes easier to do justice to a book if you haven't read it in its entirety or even opened it. Throughout this book, I will insist on the risks of reading so frequently underestimated. For anyone who intends to talk about books, and even more so for those who plan to review them. Um, so I'll stop there, but uh, this is a moment maybe, sorry, yeah. I hope this isn't a silly question, but is that whole thing tongue in cheek, or is he serious? He's serious, he's a literary critic, and he's, he's definitely serious. Um, so um, maybe, he's, maybe he's ironic, is that better than serious? But um, he is making the point to argue for this broader sense of reading. Um, he calls it unreading, but he's saying that this phenomenon is broader than opening the book and going page to page to page. So maybe he um, argues a little bit too strongly for non-reading or unreading. But I think the point that I wanted to make, or the reason that I borrow from his work here, is to just say that there is a great breadth in the phenomenon of reading that we should pay attention to. And so his big thing is unreading. That's not necessarily my thing. What I'm trying to say is I encourage you to reflect on your own experience of reading and the phenomenon of reading, which is what I'm saying. It's my answer to you about what critical reading is has to be provisional. Because as I'm going to show you later, a lot of what's going to come out of this depends on your own situation as a reader. And I don't mean your personal preferences. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. But he's a literary professor, and so part of what he's talking about comes out of relations between books and literary analysis. So I think that's where this non-reading comes from. Uh, did you find it liberating at all to, uh, to, to talk about the shame of non-reading, or I guess, you're, I guess you're not supportive of this idea? Uh, that's fair to say, yeah. <laughs> not supportive? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it just strikes me as, as quite honestly to, to, to pretend to have an intelligent conversation about a book that you haven't read just strikes me as lacking integrity. I think the thing he's getting at is that um, reading and non-reading are not binaristic opposed states. I think he's trying to get at the variety of reading and non-reading. So um, you should actually check out this book. It's not very big. And again, remember, you don't have to read the whole thing. <laughs> but, um, there's a, so he talks about that situation when you've forgotten about the text. 
Um, he uses the situation where you've forgotten the text. He also uses the situation where you yourself are so changed that your previous reading of the text is unrecognizable. So they're not especially far-fetched scenarios. Um, but they don't, they don't speak to negligence, and they don't speak to a failure of due diligence. That's not really what it's about. It's more about the, the kind of, um, how about this? Have you ever looked back at something that you wrote and not recognized it? <laughs> yeah. We've all had that. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. So he's really trying to take that, um, that disconnection seriously and say, well, what is this? So he uses this provocative language of non-reading to do it, but that's the kind of weirdness that is in the phenomenon of reading and writing that he's talking about. Lisa, yeah. Oh, sorry, there. Hi. What's your name? Margie. Margie, hi. I hope this ties in with what we're talking about, because I've been thinking lately, you know, I really want to write a book. Okay. But I don't know what I want to write about. Okay. okay. So, and I don't know how to write a book. So I just keep writing, and it's not really a book yet. I just keep writing. And I've been writing for a while. So, but and at my age, I'm thinking, well, I don't know if I would really write a novel. I really don't know, because I haven't read enough novels. So, because I haven't read enough novels, and I'm at the age I'm at, I'm thinking I shouldn't even try to be a writer. Well, I guess just to turn it around, what is the number of novels you have to have read at this age? What's well, the number? you would think to be a bet. Well, I've always heard to be a, a good writer, you have to have been read a lot of novels. Yeah, I think that um, the way that it connects to what we're talking about here, it's just this idea that there is one exact way that you're supposed to do it, which is that you are supposed to have. I guess it'll be a chart, and it'll be a very even line, right? We'll have age across one axis and we'll have books read across another axis and you know if you if the slope goes below a certain point you can't be a novelist but if you, <laughs> so i think that this kind of sense of like um not being attuned to the experience you're actually having is possibly that i that's where i see the main connection being so you could talk about your writing you could talk about your non-writing you could talk about your reading you could talk about your non-reading. But what I would say is, um, aren't you entitled to have whatever experience you're actually having with, with regard to reading and writing? Well, I was thinking maybe I should be a songwriter, because I've been around music my whole life. Well, I mean, who knows? But I, I also think, um, also, wouldn't you find out more by actually writing? So in this case, like the idea that there's only one prescribed way to do it is actually counterproductive. So what I'm trying to do today is turn that sort of um, counterproductive thinking into something that is generative. So I can't answer any of your questions, actually, but um, I can maybe provide you with some, give you an opportunity to rethink them for yourself. And that's what, what I'm trying to do for all of reading, actually, at this talk. So let's go back um, to this model. Can I do this thing? Great. Of the book. Let's look here. So remember, the first thing we're talking about is reading. We're talking about reading having to do with books. We're talking about the book being uh, a set number of encodings of texts. The book is a kind of carrier of information. So uh, this is my, uh, well, this is my, I guess, my first problem with thinking of the book as being intimately tied to reading. Do people recognize this image? No. Can you say it again, sir? Is it like fingerprints on newspaper? No. Maya, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, pictographs. These are images from the Dresden Codex. These are Mesoamerican hieroglyphs. So these are actually just kind of transcriptions from the actual text. But the text would have been printed on a kind of bark leaf, and it would have been a folding kind of codex. Um, and these are also, these are pre-colonial. So uh, these images date from, let me make sure I give you the right date. They were printed on wild fig tree bark. Uh, they were found in the Yucatan in the 16th century. Most were destroyed, however, by the conquistadors and Catholic priests. Uh, many were ordered destroyed by Bishop Diego de la Nada in July 1562. He wrote, we found a large number of books in these characters, and as they contain nothing in which were not to be seen as superstition and lies of the devil, we burned them all, while they regretted to an amazing degree and which caused them much affliction. So actually, these aren't really books, it's a codex. So it's printed on linen. But the point I wanted to make here is that reading, which we associate with books, is older than books. So if we wanted to think about reading as we can't necessarily attach reading just to books, we've had reading since before we had books. So if you think of the oldest kinds of inscriptions, the oldest kinds of inscriptions are cave paintings, which are themselves pictographs, right? So the book is just how we experience reading right now. But reading is actually independent of books. Or uh, 
exists has some kind of have some kind of excuse me existence possibly independent of books. Here's how Yin Lu puts it in an article called Ways of Reading Models for Text and the Usefulness of Dead People. In modern print cultures, the reading function of text for reasons social and cultural as much as technological has become, at least ostensibly, the dominant one. Thus, the disproportionate attention paid to scholarly editing when academic humanists discuss textuality. The dominant image of reading in elite print culture is of an individual thoughtfully perusing a book, beginning on page one and continuing to the end without being distracted by the neighbor's children, without cheating by flipping to the end to find out who done it. Early modern printers, discouraged by their technology from efficiently replicating many of the complex textual devices available to medieval scribes, turned the loss of information into a virtue. The clean, linear typography of the printed page invited a kind of reading to which Western literature elites became, and still are, emotionally attached. But reading is not the only function of a text, even now, and in other historical, social, and cultural contexts, it might not even be the primary function at all. So um, the main thing I want to show here, though, is that the book, as ubiquitous as it is, and uh, almost as hard as it is for see it, to see it, is actually a very specific cultural and historical product that has its own sort of story, independent of reading. There's a field called history of the book. Um, if people have heard of Marshall McLuhan, does anybody know Marshall McLuhan? What is his most famous <coughs> sort of aphorism? The medium is the message. He was talking actually about books, and he was talking about uh, the predominance of books uh, after the invention of the Gutenberg press, and then a sort of transition from a primarily print culture to a visual culture based on television. But uh, history of the book is the field that we associate with those kind of scholars. So if this is something that people were interested in learning more about, you could learn more about this from medieval scholars, history of the book scholars, and also communication scholars. So I won't uh, give you the history of the book, I'll just say it has one, and it's not the same thing as reading, right? Reading is a different kind of activity, uh, related to inscriptions, but not limited to them. Um, so the first problem I just want to bring up about the sort of fixity of the book is that reading doesn't necessarily depend on books. The second thing I want to get at is that the book is not just what's written inside it that the content of a book is not necessarily bounded just by what's inside the covers of the book. So even if we think of this canonical process of reading as opening the book from page to page to page and going through, um, what I'm saying is that part of what we need to know about the book doesn't rest within the book itself. So um, this will be of interest to faculty here. This is uh, Kevin Birmingham who won the Truman Capote Award for his most dangerous book, The Battle for James Joyce's Ulysses. Uh, Kevin Birmingham is the first adjunct professor to ever win this prize. And so he wrote this kind of, um, he wrote about books, um, but he did so, I'll just read you the part he wrote about books, but for faculty here, you might be interested in the rest of the speech, where he goes on to sort of describe the situation of working in the university at present. Uh, he, he's talking here about literary criticism, and he writes, literary criticism is like any other historicism, and it assumes a text's significance is not imminent, but rather radiates outward from the author to the author's family, influences, preoccupations, and further outward to friends and allies, editors and publishers, and still further outward to cultural habits and biases, to legal, political, and economic institutions. Historicists think, of all, think all of these ghosts are hovering nearby whenever a reader picks up a book. Historicism imposes order upon chaos. It finds patterns in the boggling immensity of the past. What fascinates the historicist is how a book ripples out across the wide surface of a culture, how literary intentions end up serving unforeseen interests, how meanings get warped, how people may grow rich or suffer, how what was an expression of freedom now becomes a trap, how what was virtuous now becomes immoral. And so in this essay, he then goes on to actually describe the situation of his own work as, an, as, a, as a contingent academic. Um, so for him, understanding the process of the book, it was necessary for him to understand the nature of his work within the political economy of contemporary educational institutions, um, which is something I will come back to at the end. Um, and then uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about before we go on to talk about readers is media. 
So um, a book is an artifact. It's an artifact that has a particular kind of symbolic uh, history and lineage. Uh, but inside the book, we have encodings, right? We have text, uh, we have numbers, we have charts and graphs. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be in books. It could be in digital artifacts, digital objects, magazines. We have uh, text in all of its various forms. So um, I didn't think about it this way before, but maybe one way we could problematize the book is that books certainly look like this, right? But at this moment, they also look like whatever you're carrying on your devices. They look like whatever is existing in the cloud, wherever the cloud is. Um, books come in a variety of media, so not just analog. Even within analog books, there's a great variety to analog books, digital books, books that are some combination of those. In your own lives as scholars, you have to read things other than books, like chapters of books, scholarly articles. So each of those are a format, but then they're also a media. So it's doubly complicated there. Um, again, I can't go into every particular affordance of every kind of technology, but I think in your own minds, particularly from this bit about um, best reading practices, I think we all know a bit too about uh, the different ways that media afford different kinds of reading experiences. So I think our knee-jerk reaction is to say that if it looks like this kind of book, it's good and that's the one we want. But if it's an electronic book, that's bad and that's not the one we want. And again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily allow that either. I would say this is an indeterminate space where we maybe need to know more. Here is uh, Catherine Hales. Uh, she's writing, in fact, about media specificity. And so what she means by that is that if we want to understand a particular work, we need to know not just what it says, but how it is printed or how it is digitally collected. That um, The Grapes of Wrath, the analog book, and The Grapes of Wrath, the digital facsimile of a book, do not, in fact, mean the same thing. Um, and so she calls this idea of media specificity. She writes, lulled into somnolence by 500 years of print, literary analysis should awaken to the importance of media-specific analysis, a mode of critical attention which recognizes that all texts are instantiated and that the nature of the medium in which they are instantiated matters. Central to repositioning critical inquiry, so it can attend to the specificity of the medium, is a more robust notion of materiality. Materiality is reconceptualized as the interplay between a text's physical characteristics and its signifying strategies, a move that entwines instantiation and signification at the outset. This definition opens the possibility of considering texts as embodied entities, while still maintaining a central focus on interpretation. It makes materiality an emergent property, so that it cannot be specified in advance as if it were a pre-given entity. Rather, materiality is open to debate and interpretation ensuring that discussion about the text's meaning will also take into account its physical specificity as well. Um, so again, I'm not proposing answers to any of these questions. I'm only suggesting that these are things we have to think about if we want to engage with what it means to be a book and what the limits of a book are. I want to go on. Um, I'm going to refer back again to our canonical chart. So this is the next part, again, of reading, as we commonly understand it, that we can problematize. And so this is, what does it mean to be a reader? So in this view of reading, does it matter who it is that's doing the reading? No, all readers are assumed to be sort of the same. They're only significant in that they are scanning text at a particular moment. If she reads the book and he reads the book, we assume that they'll get something similar in terms of the informational content of the book, unless one or both of them have misunderstood something. Um, so take a look at this. This is an image from a newspaper. Um, it's Al Jazeera America, but that's not important. Um, you can see this woman is reading George Orwell's 1984. Um, this is part of a political protest in Turkey. Uh, they call it the Taksim Square Book Club. But in this political protest, people go into a public space, they bring a book with them, and they stand and silently read from books. And that is the nature of the political protest. So she's reading George Orwell's 1984, a text that I assume people are familiar with. Yeah. Has anybody read this one? I think everybody yeah. had to read it, right? Everybody read it in high school. Um, so you didn't read it. OK, well, that's, I'm glad you're honest. That's, a, <laughs> that's gonna, maybe, we can, maybe we can still address this book somehow. So um, again, this is a book about totalitarianism. It's about censorship of thought. And so it's significant that she is reading it in a country um, that is undergoing a nationalist kind of, uh, the, the establishment of an autocratic nationalist government. So um, 
How could it be a political protest if they're not saying anything? How can reading be a political protest? Well, if a human is just a, a, a mechanical scanner of text, then this couldn't be a political protest. But the thing is, we're always reading from somewhere, and I mean from somewhere with respect to politics, from somewhere with respect to history, from somewhere with respect to the societies in which we live. Um, I refer to Heraclitus here who writes, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. The point here is that um, who you are and what you bring to reading is a fundamental and essential part of reading. Um, and so what part and how that relates, I think has, that's what the practice of defining what critical reading could be, has to include. Um, so your political situation, your historical situation, your embodied experience of the world, a human cannot be a mere scanner of text. There is more to reading than the mechanical process of, trans of uh, untranscribing line by line what is in a text. Um, and then uh, I think we could, we're all familiar with this experience, uh, maybe at a certain point you read a book, wasn't for you, you came back to it later, had a vastly different experience with this book, right? Is this something that's been familiar? So to me, that's kind of what this is about. That's it. Maybe that's more about your personal situation. Maybe that's more about your, it could, it could be all kinds of things. But reading 1984 in Turkey in 2013 in a public place is not the same as reading 1984 in junior high when all of us had to read it and didn't want to. It means something different. So it's not the book that's changed. It's not the text that's changed. It is things around the reader that are then embodied in the reader. So whatever we decide critical reading is, it has to include the situation of reading in all of its complexities. And so that situation could be uh, gender specific, it could be sexuality specific, it could be politics specific. I think it has to. Um, here's what uh, Naomi Barron writes about digital reading. She writes, for one-off reading, digital devices may be every good as print. But what about more serious reading? What about books that objectively merit keeping and rereading? The extent we shift our reading for print to screens will become less likely to read. A decline in rereading would make a critical shift in the way at least some types of readers have encountered books for centuries. Reading in screens raises another question about the nature of reading. Is it an individual encounter with a text or essentially a social experience? The explosive growth of online social networking has triggered online reading groups, Goodreads being but one example. Historically, if you were literate, reading was typically an individual act. Is reading on screen tipping the balance from a solitary enterprise to a social one? And if so, with what consequences? Um, so our final part of this definition of reading then is that once we have mechanically scanned the text, whatever the informational contents of that book are, go to the mind of the reader unmediated, unchanged. So if you successfully scan the contents of the book, the information that's in the book is now in your mind, um, in its totality, unchanged. Um, so I'm going to go about this a couple of different ways. Um, so can everybody see the picture in the upper left? It's a little bit small for those of you in the back. Uh, in the upper left, what you see is a picture of the Mundaneum, and it's taken a, in the, about 1918. So um, the Mundaneum is sometimes called a Victorian internet or a steampunk internet. So what this was was a guy called Paul Audley had a utopian vision, and he said somebody should get all the information that's in all the books in the world, and they should make it available to everyone. And so he had these women who are called, some of whom are called indexers, some of whom are called computers, but these are women who have been hired to read all the books in the world, and then they transcribe what's in the book, they distill it down to a couple facts, and they write it on the dominant information technology of 1918, which is the 3 by 5 index card. Um, and so then, they file all these 3 by 5 index cards away. Lisa knows this story, I'm sure. Um, they file all these index cards away, uh, and then they cross-reference them by author, by subject, but in this way, they meant to make all the information in the world available to everyone. They tried to extract the informational contents of those books just by writing it down on little cards. They would also have a reference service, so you could use the Telegraph to their office in Belgium and ask them a question, and then they would go look it up in their universal index of everything. 
Um, it's important to recognize, too, this is tied to a very utopian vision, right? That all the information in the world can be made available to everyone. And it separates information from the text. It separates uh, the intellectual contents of the book or all the books in the world from their binding. Um, the point I want to make here, though, is that what they're trying to get at is not what is contained in any one book. They're trying to get at what is contained in every book and also what is contained between books. So part of what they're doing is explaining the relations between things. So as they supposedly just kind of transcribe this relationship, they actually create it through this giant universal index of everything. But the thing to think about is that this idea and this impulse is old and very tied up with our way of thinking about knowledge. But um, it's the recognition that some of what we call human knowledge isn't specifically in a text, it's held between texts. Or maybe it's better to say, we can't have a piece of knowledge that lives independently. A piece of knowledge has to be incorporated with all the other things that are known. So one, um, I don't know what we want to call a unit of information, let's just call it a byte. Uh, it isn't valuable, it isn't knowledge, until it's related to all the rest of human knowledge. Another way of saying that, take a look at this. Um, have people seen this kind of diagram before? This is a pretty uh, popular form of data visualization. This is um, what is visualized here are bibliographic relationships between uh, met different kinds of medical literature, or actually the subjects inside different journal articles. But this network diagram <coughs> with these, these dots that are called nodes and these lines that connect all the different nodes, and nodes that are bigger if they're connected to more things, um, can be used to, to represent all kinds of data. Um, here, though, what they're trying to show you is, this is a picture of publications from a famous database called PubMed, and this is a visualization of publications that are about heart disease. And so what is visualized is the way that all these different publications about heart disease, all these different dots, cite each other or mention each other in studies. So these ones that are big dots, all the papers that are written about heart disease cite this paper. All the pictures, all the ones, all these other ones, these kind of bigger, more central ones, everybody refers to those canonical papers on heart disease. So if you want to write about heart disease, you have to connect to this guy. This is, um, what it represents is actually not super important to us, but again, it's just a contemporary way of looking at this same thing. But often what we want to know about, or what we consider knowledge, or what we, what we need to know about, is held between things. It's held in a network of things. So if you want to know about heart disease, one publication about heart disease is great, right? But even if you read all the publications about heart disease, that's still not exactly it. What you need to know is how they fit together. That's the thing that you need to know if you want to understand heart disease. And then I'll end here with this last one. Um, does anybody recognize this? This is a, a very typical kind of medieval illustration of human knowledge. It's called a tree of knowledge. Yeah. And so this is how medieval scholars thought of the world of knowing as being arranged. So they'll have like the trunk of a tree will be like religion. And then um, the, a couple branches up will be like philosophy and law. And then the kind of silly and not very important um, branches of human knowledge like science would be up at the top, right? So as time goes on, what constitutes the trunk and what constitutes wow. the branch change. So in contemporary times, these are still used, people still generate these to talk about sort of the, the interrelationship of all the different forms of human knowledge. But again, I want to just get at this idea that part of what we need to know is not held in the mind of a person or held inside a unitary book, it's held between things, that it's actually the relationship between things that we're trying to get at. So when we read, we're not just trying to extract information from some book, we're trying to place information in context. We're trying to take what we know and relate it to other things that are known inside our own minds, but also outside of our own minds. So in relation to other people, in relation to other texts. Um, and people are still working with this, uh, this tree of knowledge concept. Here's a scholar called Steyer, writing in 2016. Uh, the branches of knowledge are not strewn randomly on the ground. They are part of a coherent, interconnected tree. Physics is the most fundamental of all the sciences, so it is the trunk of the tree. 
The branch of chemistry emerges from physics because the laws of chemistry depend on the laws of physics. Chemical reactions occur the way they do because of the physical properties of atoms. Biology's branch splits off from chemistry's. The molecules that comprise living things are bound by the rules of chemistry. Scientists, while grasping this fundamental interconnection of the broad boughs of the natural sciences, have rarely craned their necks sufficiently to glimpse the upper reaches of the tree of knowledge, the green canopy of human culture that is the traditional jurisdiction of the social sciences and humanities. In fact, scholars from all disciplines have mostly proceeded as though the greenery above was the outgrowth of a neighboring tree from a fundamentally different species. Um, so a very long way of just saying uh, this bit about interconnection between things being what we're after. So if we return again to our canonical uh, model of reading, so far thoroughly discredited, um, we see that at each, at each step there are questions that we need to ask about our common understanding of what reading is. And to me that's what critical reading is. Critical reading is asking questions about what the process of reading can be and what situation we're in that requires reading, what we'll bring to bear on this process of reading as scholars, as people alive at this particular moment. Um, and so the final picture I'll leave you with, if it doesn't look like those icons I showed you, what does it look like? Maybe something like this. Um, this is an untitled painting by Keith Haring. I'll borrow from uh, Professor Rob Fox one more time. But the challenge to look at this picture is that we have to find a way to enter into it. And so it presents itself first as a complexity and as a whole. It's too big to take in all at once. But if we start to focus on small areas, we can find a way into the image to sort of start to interpret how it works. So um, if critical reading is what we're doing, I think it looks something like this or something equally incomprehensible. And again, the situation that we're all in, or the reason that we're all here tonight, is that we are related to this institution. So our reading, the situation that we're in is related to our scholarship or to our studies. Um, everyone here is some kind of scholar, I assume, um, past, present, or future. Um, so I'll end with uh, a brief excerpt about the importance of reading to scholarship, um, which again might seem obvious, but it's not. Uh, what's the most important thing you have to do as students? What is, what is foremost in your mind as a student before I read you this? Um, for, for say for next week. What's going on next week? What's, are you a student? Yeah. What's the most important thing you have to do for next week? Yeah, write an essay. Right. That sounds very typical. Is that what other people have to do? Yeah. So what I'm saying is we could probably go through this to-do of things that you had to do for next week. And reading would show up, but it probably wouldn't be first, right? Like the actual business of your student life, the transactions that you do to be a student, involve turning in papers, going to classes, um, they involve all kinds of doing problem sets, right? In theory they involve reading, but being a, a scholar at this particular moment involves a certain kind of sidelining of reading. We could do the same thing to those of you who are faculty here, who are working here. If I said, what do you have going on for next week, what's the most pressing thing? It would be like um, preparing a lecture, writing an evaluation, um, doing administrative work, reading would actually sort of recede from it. So there's a way in which it's assumed, because we're scholars, we all have a handle on reading, we know what it is and we do it all the time. But in reality, I think if we reflected on our own experience, we'd see there's a way that it could kind of easily slip away from us, that all the work of scholarship can demote reading. So um, like here's Steyer again. Uh, away from scholarly life as monastic and isolated. Uh, in the present university governance model, emphasizing calculative practices based on, for example, publication, data, scholarly reading is easily downplayed as an inherited privilege, not of necessity being conducive to either academic success nor scholarly recognition. In contrast, by advocating scholarly reading as a centrally located professional practice in scholarly communities, this article emphasizes that scholarly reading is the primus motor of academic knowledge production. To discredit scholarly reading as what directs attention away from more pressing academic concerns within the existing governance model thus undermines the long-term commitment to scholarly know-how and expertise. A more nuanced and detailed debate regarding the practices of academic knowledge production and the role of scholarly reading is needed. Um, so, to summarize what we've done so far, we've talked about 
a model of reading that is sort of linked in the distinction between critical and uncritical reading. And we said, we don't want to just append a set of best practices to our reading, although those best practices certainly we should follow. We want to try to come up with some other way of understanding reading. So all I've really done is present some questions about reading and places to look. But uh, in my mind, your responses to those questions are what critical reading would be. Um, so again, I can't, I can't answer them for you. I think those are the kinds of things that you might want to address um, and should address given the significance of reading to scholarly life. Okay? That's it. So we could do a couple things. If there are questions or comments, we could do that. And then I also promised to people who saw the talk earlier to bring some specific tools that we could use. And so I do have a brief technical demonstration if people are interested in tools. Which you want to have? Some, are there questions that people want to ask or things that they want to say? Yes. So what do you do about your? What do you do if you have like this? Okay. Well, we talked about that a little bit briefly, right? Like, as a scholar, if I'm your teacher and I ask you to read, I kind of treat you like that reading machine out of necessity, right? And so you're not allowed to dislike the text or have a kind kid or some other present commitment. I just assume that once you disappear from the classroom, you go off into the world and you just you return with the, that informational content absorbed into your mind. So um, I'll have to turn it back to the audience to see what tips they use. Um, but I think what you're getting at is when you say negative views of reading, um, are you talking about the experience of, of reading being unpleasant, or are you talking about like things, feelings about a particular text? Okay, so like negative feelings of reading as a whole. Are there other people who share those sentiments? I'm sorry, what's the question? The question is like, how should we, in developing our practice of critical reading, how would we accommodate negative feelings towards reading? Towards reading itself. I think so. Yeah. Isn't that what we're talking about? Or towards this kind of reading? Towards the reading that is required for doing academic work. For that kind of reading that we're kind of valorizing in this discussion. There's things that I think we all probably would just define as that very easy way of understanding critical reading. The kind you have to write about, the kind that you do in preparation for writing papers. So um, I would have to hear from the group then what people have done. I can tell you what I did, but I don't, I don't know if it would help you. But I think maybe the broader question is like, what is the role of pleasure in reading? Does it always have to be unpleasant to do the kind of reading that you have to do for school? Yeah. The material is interesting. Well, first, let's be real. It's sometimes unpleasant. Can we just can we start there? OK, it's sometimes unpleasant. OK, um, it's sometimes it's. I guess what I'm thinking is that it's work, or it can feel like work. Yeah. And yeah. so is, is this a whistle while you work, and you're going to really enjoy your work type situation? I think it can be. I guess the thing that we, I, I guess not to sound pessimistic, but I would say um, I don't think we can expect that work will always be pleasurable. I think work can be gratifying, but moment to moment it might be unpleasant. And so what do you do when you encounter a text, the experience of which is incredibly unpleasant? Have a drink. <laughs> Have a drink. I, I wouldn't say no to that. I don't know. You drink too much, not be able to read. So, what do you? I first step into that particular test. It's getting rid of the constructive idea of gonna be boring. Yeah. I actually approach the particular group with curiosity. Yeah. So trying to see what can I give away from. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's maybe a good start but um, maybe to focus on what you're trying to get out of it. Yeah. I think you're gonna have to kind of like back up off of it a little bit. If you go in thinking, I hate this, this is unpleasant, this is unpleasant, and then you sit down, it's like, well, you're gonna crash. So what were you gonna say? Well, you know, if, if you're in the psychology, if you're studying the psychology department, you know, it's gonna, it, part of you, are not gonna be able to avoid analyzing, you know, why it is that you're resisting it and all that. So, so I think it would, you, you sort of step outside of the actual text and say, okay, so why is this so difficult? Why am I resisting it? Well, you know, what, what's, what's causing all this? And by analyzing that, maybe you can find a way to get through it, even if it doesn't make it more pleasant necessarily. 
but your your comprehension may increase once you understand what it is you're resistant to. Yeah, that's excellent. And so I think the thing that I responded to in what you said is the way that um, it's in fact a critical process because you just said, well, you have to. Not in this way we were rehearsing before. It's like, well, I ask myself questions about the text. In this case, you have to actually ask questions of yourself, which is like, why am I resisting this? What is this doing to me that I'm that I'm uh, that is making me resistant to it? But I definitely think that's the critical reading. That's where it gets critical. What were you going to say? Well, I was just going to add that you know to to, to the metaphor of, of the painting too, in that it's a, it's a bit like putting together a jigsaw puzzle sometimes, right? In that that you know you know you're not going to solve the whole thing, especially if it's a difficult text, right? That you that is painful for you to go in. That you you can't get the whole picture immediately, so find those little slices or images that you're familiar with, right? That you can make sense out of, and then build from from those, just like you would a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, that's um. That's definitely it. But I think what we got, again, these are just general kinds of things. This is going to be a process for you. But I think for sure, maybe ask yourself questions about how you feel about it. Maybe find a way to be curious about it or see if there's something in the text that you could try to take away from it. Or maybe this, like, uh, find some small part of it that you could enter into. I think also um, you have to be honest about why you're reading. And so why you're reading is that you're a student and you've been compelled to read it and that you're going to use it for something, ostensibly for a paper, ostensibly for your own understanding of the field. So um, in my own life, when I get something that's difficult to read or that I feel like it's going to be difficult, I remind myself that this is my work, this is my job, and then I treat it like, I, take, I treat reading like I do any other job. I take a big job, I break it down into small manageable parts, I put it on the clock, I time myself yeah. if I need to, but um, what I'm trying to get out is that part of the work of being a scholar is dealing with this very issue. Mm -hmm. this, and then again, it, all of our answers are just provisional. It, it's going to depend reader to reader. What were you going to say? Well, I forgot know, to ask your name, I'm sorry. Jesse. Jesse, what were you going to say? And, well, we also assume that we all know how to read because oh, we can see the words on the page and, and, and you know we're comprehending them to some degree, but actually it's a process, it's a learning process. We don't know all know how to read in the same way, we don't know how to read, you know, to, to, to the same level of understanding. So I feel like when I'm reading a book, I'm learning how to read that book as opposed to every other book. And also, you know, some books are just more complicated and the ones you're going to be reading for these courses are going to be, you know, even more complicated. So it, it's improving you as a reader and that maybe is a way to look at it. Like, you know, the benefit I'm getting out of this may not be the actual material, but I'm learning how to read that material critically and absorb what it, get what I need out of it. Yeah, and so um, I guess I would go again to this part of the diagram where we talked about the human just being some kind of information scanning apparatus. I like, um, did you say Jesse? Yes. I like Jesse's idea that the, tre the, the text is training you how to read it. Yeah. Because then we could kind of imagine a situation where the author of the text has done some work creating this text, creating the text in this shape, not some other text. Mm -hmm. And then you as the reader, you have to do some work too. And so you're going to try to meet in the middle. And so um, the middle, if you're lucky, right? Because some, some texts are very demanding. They demand that you get all the way over here. Some texts are not very demanding. So it's like it's very easy to get, right? But I think what you're talking about is a situation where a text is being demanding. And so we, we experience, you use the word negative emotions. But I, I think that sense of um, someone being demanding is, can be a very negative sensation. But I, I think that's what's happening is that you've encountered a text it is making demands on you. And so you have to kind of deep well, what's in it for me? What's a reasonable amount of demand? And how can I meet these demands in a way that will also work with all the other demands you have to your teacher, to your classmates, to your life as a human, your boss, maybe your kids, I don't know. Um, yes, sir? Yeah, so one of the things that I've experienced over time is that reading to me for, has become for me more of a sort of a four-dimensional experience than a two or three-dimensional experience. It's not, you know, the, I think in school, it, there's this urgency to read this thing and understand it now, as if that's the presumption, that, or, or the, that that's the, the sense of obligation we have to it. Whereas I think, you know, I've had, just like texts change over time, Minders, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and think about something that I read 10 years ago, and it, you know, it will occur to me in a completely different way than it did then. So, I mean, I'm, I'm always asking students to be sort of patient with what they read. It may make absolutely no sense to them now. 
And that's not a lost opportunity. It's actually an investment in a future opportunity, or the, has the possibility of being an investment in a future opportunity. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And so I think, too, that invites us to maybe create <laughs> critical reading practice that has a very long frame of reference, right? That um, the things that you, you could have a, a reading practice where you encounter texts without knowing. Um, I forgot to ask reading also, I'm sorry. Donald. As Donald is saying, that will have some effect on you that is not immediately uh, apparent. But I do want to say on behalf of students, they are in a transactional kind of setting, right? Like oh, yeah. you have the stuff you need to do for school. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying is like, um, it's possible to do both of those things, to get the transaction that you need accomplished to get the stuff you've done with a paper, and to participate in some kind of practice that will be enriching at some point. I think actually most teachers probably, if they had to dump one, would dump the transactional reading, right? They would just be like, well, read whatever is gonna fulfill you as a person. But that's just, that's not how school works, right? But what I'm saying is somehow you have to recognize, reconcile these competing demands and then hopefully you could build something in your own practice that would enrich you further away. So you get the transaction and you would get enrichment later. But again, you're gonna to have to you're gonna to have to work through that. It would definitely be work at some point. I wonder too, Donald, is there um, a relationship between the sense of pleasure that is often missing from reading and what you're talking about? This kind of like time element? Is it just a case of delayed gratification? I, I I'm not the right person to ask because I, I, you know, for me, reading was such a traumatic experience. I'm, I'm dyslexic, so and have been, you know, and, and have had to sort of train my brain to take. Reading is still, I don't want to say a painful act, but it's a, it's always a challenging act. Yeah, for me. Yeah. And that's actually that experience that I just described is the thing that made it. A richer experience for me when I discovered that that was, you know, it's, I think to to your point about the transaction, the transaction has this tendency to kind of obscure the actual long-term experience of the reading because we have to read it now so that we can write a paper or so that we can come to class feeling like we're prepared, you know, to discuss the text. But it's so much, it's so much, and it has such such a much longer shelf life in that if I think if you if you if it's allowed to do that yeah I definitely often say like to make space for it so like to make space for reading in that way then you could sort of get into that that, that zone that he's talking about not guaranteed but certainly possible purely transactional view it's like well you're never you're never going to get there um uh, thanks for that are there other questions I, I was just going to kind of piggyback on what you were saying. Yeah, I saw you nodding. It, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, how do you write a paper on that? I mean, something that you read that you really didn't really get much out of. And if if I if things happen like that for me, and, and it has in some cases where I think about something I read five years ago or something like that, and I, and I get that aha moment. Um, but in, in reading for school, and having to write a paper, how does, you know, how do you do that? I mean, like, uh, mm -hmm. I've had difficulty in that. Yeah, well, just like reading and writing, they're obviously closely related, but in both cases, you have to find a way into it. I mean, I think when you kind of are in the zone, in reading and in writing, in both cases, you're, you're in the zone and you're kind of like functioning well. Mm -hmm. This is when you um, are making a very outrageous argument in a paper and feeling very excited about it. You know, oh, the teacher's going to go crazy for this. Or maybe at this point you don't I care. I did that last night. Uh, good for you. She got into the zone. She got into the zone. And so at that point, you don't even really care about the transaction, right? Like at this point, you're just very taken with the activity. So um, I don't, I cannot give you directions for how to get into the zone. I can only tell you that it's possible um, and that it is required. You can't get through what we're doing as scholars unless you find a way to connect to that. So I would say first, be honest with yourself. And so when you have negative emotions about something, I don't think it's useful to pretend that you're not having them. I think you need to find some way to deal with them. So if it's about writing, if it's about reading, if it's about math, whatever kind of anxiety you're having, the first thing you have to do is just be realistic that we're having it. And um, we talked a lot about shame in this conversation, and I think it just comes up because there are these expectations that we're going to experience reading, writing, or math, or whatever, in this um, very mechanical way that it's going to be, you know, you're going to just be able to go right in, sit in your chair, take your notes, and everything's going to be great. But I don't think anybody experiences that way, but for whatever reason, it's, it's difficult to talk about. 
So um, I think first be honest, and then beyond that, I don't know. I think we're all just kind of groping along, trying to figure out what works for ourselves. But um, there is pleasure and gratification in it, but I, I can't tell you for sure where it will be. But um, maybe if you hold space for it, you can, you can figure that out. Like what would happen if you thought of your reading and writing as a scholarly practice, and it was like a sort of thing that you do like any other practice, you do it with some regularity, maybe without a great sense of where it will go. Well, today's writing didn't really amount to much, but maybe tomorrow's will be better. Today's reading was difficult, but maybe tomorrow's will be this kind of like regular practice. I think that's kind of, I think that's where a lot of good stuff happens. But again, that's just for me. I don't know if that's going to be true for everyone. Um, does anybody else want to have, have a question or comment? Yes, sir. I think early in the presentation you talked about I think it was a list of sort of best practices. Yes. Uh, I didn't get the memo. Can I get a copy of that? <laughs> sure, no problem. So Dean Richards has put together an incredibly useful list, which is really practical. And so this is like some things you can do while you're actually reading. This is the opposite of my talk, which has been largely <laughs> theoretical. This is another kind of, I believe theory is a tool. You can use it to do stuff. But these are tools like a list of sort of techniques you could try. And I think actually for people who are having difficulty reading, this would be helpful because it gives you stuff to do. So um, it says, who looked at the list? Okay, the list, we'll have to put the list, I think we can probably put it somewhere at the library, and then we could also um, circulate it somehow, but um, can I get back to you on where the list is? I don't actually know. Um, if, if I might just interrupt here, um, yes, please. most of you folks have been kind enough to sign in and provide your email address. Uh, I'll email the list. Oh, yeah. right. And then I wonder... To all of you, and if you haven't signed in, please do. I wonder if, Lisa, can the and list live on the library's website somewhere? Yep. Oh, so that's another thing we could do with the list. So we'll send it to you, but also it could live there. But this, again, I don't mean to undercut the usefulness of this list. This list is, a, is every resource you could possibly need, all self-guided, to help you with your own reading practice. And so I'm sure you'll find some things in there that are useful for you. And um, the list has things like specific exercises you can do as you read, tips about how to read, sometimes not in the order of the book, like things like scanning the introduction first, looking to see what kind of evidence is used, and then doing your reading so that you know kind of what to expect. Um, so these are the kinds of things that are there. And so I didn't mean in any way to discount the importance of practical skills. Um, I just meant to kind of give them a house to live in. Um, are there other questions? Okay, so thanks very much for coming. I appreciate it.